Architects are very passive in the way that they do marketing. Business of Architecture, episode 304. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where we explore the intersection between design and enterprise, otherwise known as the business of architecture. What would happen if an anthropologist studied architects, specifically how architects engage with clients at the beginning stage of a project, the client acquisition stage? In case you need a reminder, as I did, an anthropologist is a person who studies humans, specifically the social interactions and behaviors of humans. Darby Morris is an anthropologist. For her PhD dissertation, she observed three architecture firms over the course of one year, so she studied these three firms. She sat in the offices of these firms observing how they engage with their clients primarily during the pre-design phase, which includes marketing and business development. In her own words, architects, despite being known for being egotistical at times, are not loud enough about who they are because they often don't know who they are and are not. Even if they did know who they are, how in a field where advertising was banned for 70 years do they get the word out to the larger public? Once hired, architects are consistently designing for clients who often don't seem to understand exactly what their needs are for the project at hand. How do they get around this? This is what we'll be discussing on today's show and more. Today's episode is sponsored by the Dream Practice Accelerator, the leading business design program for architecture firms. Whether you're an early stage startup, mid-career firm owner, or a mature practice, the Dream Practice Accelerator can help you design and create your ideal firm to achieve your vision faster. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash reviews to discover more. And with that, Let's get on with today's show. Hello, Darby, and welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Hello. Darby, tell me, how does an anthropologist get interested or involved in architecture? It's a good question. Um, So I started out, um, I went to um, India my junior year in college and was really taken by uh, the space between people. Um, so Edward Hall kind of proxemics um, of like how people uh, engage in the space because I saw that men were a lot closer there than they are here and uh, men and women occupy space different in residential architecture there. When you say um, men closer, can I, can I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when you say men no. closer, what do you mean? Like men hold hands and are very free to relax on each other. And I would say behavior that we here in the Western world associate with uh, someone who might be gay, um, there is just regular friends kind of interaction. So that really struck me uh, as something that was different there. Very interesting. And tell me before we get too far, just for our audience and even for my own ignorance, what exactly is an anthropologist? Yeah, it's a good question. So an anthropologist um, is typically somebody who studies people. uh, And we use a variety of methods, um, usually qualitative methods rather than quantitative methods, to observe people, to interview people, and to engage with people. And to to give you like the the short story, (laughs) but from India to where I am now, I spent a year for my PhD with three different architecture firms observing how they engaged with and pursued their clients. So that's kind of the short story of how I got to where I am today and and how I worked as an anthropologist. Well, we would just love to hear your insights that you gained while working with these architecture firms. Yeah, so it was it was an interesting process. Architects are not too used to, and I'm not sure anybody is, <laughs> very used to uh, having somebody who simply observes you and doesn't really ask questions, doesn't really talk to you very much. They're every single day of the week as if I were working at the firm. So I spent three months with each of the three firms and as if I were a regular employee. So I'd come in around eight or nine in the morning and leave, you know, when uh, people started to leave around 5 p.m. Um, every day. And I went to all kinds of meetings that they had with their clients. The, this was typically prior to when the architecture firm was hired. So I went to the 
pre-proposal meetings and the interviews and on the rare occasion that the architecture firm got hired, I also observed um, some of the programming process. And after observing for that length of time, which was, like I said, about a year, I spent some time and wrote up and analyzed all of my findings and really uh, wrote down the process step-by-step step of what the architect goes through and what the client goes through prior to getting hired and what kinds of things they might be able to change in that process to try to get hired easier or get whatever outcome they want. Uh, they, uh, some firms obviously want to get hired as the outcome, but sometimes the outcome is that like they know that they're not gonna get hired for that particular project, but they might wanna get hired for a future project. So whatever that outcome is that that, that, that firm wants, um, how they could make that more, a smoother process. And did you find that it was the exception rather that the the rather than the rule when a firm actually would get hired for the project? Yes, it was an interesting thing because um, I would say so the firms that I was w with were all fairly large firms. Um, the smallest firm that I was with um, was just over 50 employees and the largest firm was well over a thousand. So these were all very large firms and I would, and all of them uh, from the beginning told me that they have about 75% repeat clients and uh, therefore they typically win about 75% of the projects that are coming to them. But in reality, I observed about 60 clients and I would say 90% of those were losses. It's an interesting process to go through. And I think part of that is um, that people don't tend to count the firms that like they might start uh, responding to the RFP and then realize quickly that like it's not the project for them or different situations like that. Those are typically not counted in that 75%, I would say. Got it. Now, these firms, what kind of architecture do they do? They do, they all do a variety of architecture, but I was primarily focused on workplace or corporate or office architecture, whatever that particular firm would call that. And each of the firms defined that term slightly differently than the other firms, but that's what I was generally looking at. And, you know, for the small firm, they might define a museum as a as a workplace client where for the large firm a museum might have its own category so that's kind of some of the differences that i saw between the types of things that they defined as workplace when you first began this observation in this study was there anything that surprised you and if so what was it i think that the thing that it's interesting to observe a process as an outsider because there are things that like you know, I, I didn't know a lot about architecture going into this. Um, and that's one of the things that actually anthropologists hold really close to us is no matter what group we're studying and no matter whether it's people here in the US like I did or people in India, um, one of our first uh, number one rules is that you know nothing. And so as someone coming into something knowing nothing, it, I often would compare the architecture uh, marketing and pursuit process to other industries. And what I found was that architects are very passive in the way that they do marketing. So, and there's a variety of reasons for this, but uh, just as an, an, an example, you're not gonna like see a um, TV commercial for an architecture firm, or you're not going to see really any like even newspaper uh, advertisements. There's not a lot of um, advertising, number one, and even in the interview process that they that they do, um, they're often looking to the client to tell them what should be presented in the interview rather than having an idea and going in and presenting it and kind of selling themselves, quote unquote, which I know is not a great term for, for most architects. But yeah, that, that was really the, the thing that struck me the most about about it being such a different process. And why was that surprising to you? So it's an interesting thing because in the beginning it was very surprising to me because I've seen so many other services and I even had my own company as a birth doula for a little while where I did a lot of that marketing and did a lot of that um, what I'm calling selling of the 
of my own services. And so it was surprising to not see that initially with the architecture firms, but I did a lot of research for my dissertation and found out that actually it shouldn't be surprising because architects have been pursuing clients in this way for many, many decades, even centuries. And so uh, for architects, this is kind of the norm and how things have been. To give an example, our, uh, advertising was banned in, in architecture till the 70s when the ban was lifted. Um, so it was something that uh, was surprising to me in today's times, but looking back at it historically, it made a lot of sense. Do you have any specific stories about particular instances or anecdotes where you were in a meeting or you saw something and you thought, wow, that's, that's really interesting. I never would have guessed that they would have done it that way. Yeah, I think that the, the things that were surprising to me kind of became more daily as I, as I observed the process more and more. So they're, they're more typical for me now. But I can tell you the things that uh, really worked. And some of those were surprising even for the firms themselves when I came back to them. So one of the things that uh, really was surprising when I came back to the firms and presented the work and said, hey, these are things that you could do. I talked about them relaxing more and really presenting themselves as they are and, and showing their personality more. And the, the clients that the architecture firms were able to really open up and show their own personality were the clients that they typically won. So for one of these firms, the, the firm mentioned, you know, every time our CEO goes in and cusses, we often win the project. Are you telling us that we should stop cussing? And I said, no, that's exactly the opposite of what I'm trying to tell you. Because what, what it means is that that person, when, he, when that person is very relaxed, cussing is what they do. And so if cussing is your personality, um, then being able to show it and being able to cuss around others um, means that you're making a connection and makes sense why uh, cussing would, for that particular individual, um, mean that they often won the project. Um, rather than, you know, somebody when they're trying to put on a face or put on a, a personality, um, it wouldn't make it, it would make it worse and make it dif more difficult for them to engage with their clients. Fantastic. Well, I have a feeling that's, that's one of the tips that you might share with us, but I'm sure my audience is absolutely dying to know, what can they do to up their win rate to get hired more and, and achieve more of the goals that they're going after in this process? Yeah, some of these things are much uh, more, much easier than other things. And it ob obviously depends on the particular client. So it's hard to give um, blanket statements that will always win, always work for every client. But some of the things are, are just to, to break things down and, and really like the more you can engage with your clients before the interview, the better. So going to pre-proposal meetings, um, trying to set up, one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations, whenever it is possible. Those kind of things really help for you to get to know each other. And often when you get to know each other more, um, then that, that really helps uh, win the project. Things like doing a really short interview where you, instead of having like a, an hour-long presentation to your client, you shorten that um, as much as you possibly can to maybe like 30 minutes. And then really open the rest of the time up to that one-on-one -on -one engagement of the question answer process. Making things as succinct as possible, I would think, I, I think um, really helps. But also some of the things that I saw were that architects often spent a lot of time talking about things that they never brought up in front of the clients. And I thought that that was really interesting. So some of these things were like, what's the difference between you and your competitors? They would often spend a lot of time trying to figure out who their competitors were for that particular project and what the differences were between them and their competitors in general or for that specific client, but they would never bring that up during the interview or in front of the client. That's really something that I think would help because it shows the client you're not, uh, the, the concern that um, people spoke about was bragging. And instead of coming across as bragging, you're just coming across as knowing what your differences are. You know, knowing that you are a firm that has a specific 
like does city planning when other firms don't do city planning, if that client might be interested in city planning, um, bringing those kind of things up. Um, the other thing that I saw is uh, that firms would spend a lot of time trying to figure out exactly which projects to present to in that interview. Um, and they would go over a lot of them and talk about the different ways in which that particular project pertained to that client. But when it came to the interview, they would just present the project and not bring up at all why, what the connection might be to that client. Um, and doing those, those little things where you can connect to the client, um, even within the, the presentation itself, would make things a lot easier. And, and often comes across to the client as like, you've done your research and you're inter genuinely interested in us, which is something that uh, really helps. And also one of the things that I found with my own practice is that if you don't know the, the client, um, being very honest with that, being very honest with, hey, I, I don't know you guys. Uh, I don't know what you're looking for with this. Um, it, it comes across as like, well, why would someone want to hire you if you don't know? But the, the truth is that, again, in the, in the beginning, you don't know about their culture. You don't know about the, the way they are, the, that problem formed and the reason why they're hiring you uh, as an architecture firm to a great extent. You know what they've written in RFP or things like that, but you don't know a lot more in certain situations. But you do know a lot about how to solve those problems. And if you come to them and say, hey, I don't know a lot about you, but I do know a lot about how to solve this problem. So I want to work with you so that you can teach me and you can be the expert on your own culture um, so that I can get hired to be the expert on solving that problem that you're having within your culture. So those are a couple of examples. Um, I think ultimately being louder about who architects are in general, like it would be great if people outside of the architecture industry could name an architecture firm, could name several architecture firms in the area. And being very vocal about that would be great. But I think that is a longer quest than some of those examples that I brought up earlier. Darby, you've said architects, despite being known for being egotistical at times, maybe that's a caricature, you said are not loud enough about who they are because they often don't know who they are and are not. What do you mean by that? Yeah, um, I think it's always funny when people talk about about the, the ego of, of the architecture firm, um, because I think that, you know, we have a lot of books and um, other things written about how um, egotistical architects can be when it comes to in, in interacting with the client around the design. But that is later on in the process than where I was really observing. And I was really not observing the design process. I was observing much earlier than that. Um, and so what I found, um, again, was in that early stage of like trying to approach clients, trying to find clients, they would often find clients through their connections with others in the building industry rather than uh, through you know, the client companies themselves and through networking that they had done with the type of client company that they wanted to pursue. I think often, regardless of whether, what size firm it is, um, people are so desperate for work, they'll take on anything. And it, it, it takes time for an architect to realize like, no, that's not actually my personality. That's not actually the type of client that I want to work with. And the bolder you are about, no, this is the type of client that I want to work with, the more other people will acknowledge that both in the building industry and outside of it and be able to point clients to you. If you're known as someone who, you know, loves to do kitchens and really loves to um, get into like very intricate tile work, then like if people know that and if you can really embrace that, um, then people will, will point to you if, if their client mentions wanting tile work or something like that. Um, so that, that's just a very easy example, but I think that the, the fear of not, not getting enough clients often 
confuses the issue and makes people makes people and firms much more generalized than really they need or want to be, if that makes sense. And Darby, do you have any suggestions? How do architects, architecture firms go about really crystallizing who they are? I think this uh, sometimes depends on on the size of the firm. Um, so with with uh, with one, you know, with a really small firm that's like one or two people, um, they can. It's it's a lot easier to get to know oneself and get to know like, oh, that project didn't work, and I didn't in I didn't enjoy working with that client, and therefore I'm not going to do th do projects with clients like that again. With a larger firm, because there are so many people and so many different personalities, it, it becomes a little bit more challenging to really find out who the firm is at a, as a whole. But it, it is still possible. Um, and sometimes with the large firms, you have like one CEO or head person or star architect who really uh, is the personality that the firm congeals around. But sometimes... Uh, just trying to figure out, you know, how to, what, what you want and what you don't want. And uh, going back to that, like, what are your differences between you and, and your competitors? Um, and what do you want to be your, the differences between you and your competitors? I think answering some of those questions and really doing some strategic planning early on would really help. I didn't see a lot of strategic planning um, when I was with these firms. So that was a piece that was kind of missing. And yeah, I think some of the people uh, on your podcast have talked about that process a little bit more in depth. Yeah, they have. And I invite our listeners to go back. They can go just search for business of architecture strategic planning to find any of those episodes or articles that we've developed. And that's an interesting insight. Now, when you share these insights with the, went back with the architecture firms and actually shared them, what was their reaction? What were the insights that they gained through this process? I got a variety of different responses from the firms. One of the firms uh, was basically, they thought that they were doing a lot of the things that I was bringing to them. So they were very happy to know that they were going down the right path and were able to, you know, have some, some conversations around the topic and realize that like they, they're going in the right direction, um, which I think is great. Um, and then uh, one of the firms was like, well, can you give me an example of a firm that is exactly like us that is doing these things that you're talking about? And I was like, no, not, not really, because no one's, no one's exactly like you, number one. And number two, some of these things are maybe a little bit outside of the norm for an architecture firm. So trying things out that are a little different um, might be a little s scary to that particular firm. And then the third firm was really fascinated by, you know, trying to figure out what the differences were between them and the other two firms and um, really trying to, initially it's, it came across like they were trying to make themselves more like the other two firms that the, all three of them are competitors of each other. Um, so I can understand the desire to make yourselves more like other firms so that potentially you could get more clients. But what I was encouraging them and, and um, some of the conversation that we had was around, instead of trying to be like the other firms, embracing their differences and acknowledging that, you know, they are not an AE firm, they have these differences from their competitors. Um, that uh, a lot of uh, clients might, m might hire them for and might, might want them for. So yeah, it, I had a lot of really great conversations. I've also uh, gone to uh, local chapters of the AIA and presented my work um, at AIA Huron Valley, which is in Michigan, and also AIA San Francisco, and started some good conversation around uh, these things as well. Darby, you've said once, once hired, architects are consistently designing for clients who don't seem to understand exactly what their needs are for the project at hand. How do they get around this? Uh, when clients don't know what what the um, what they're looking for, or when architects don't know what they're looking for. Well, let's address both questions. Yeah, I think that the process is really interesting because the way the process is set up right now, uh, clients have to decide, have to do a lot of initial legwork 
um, sometimes with a, a real estate company or a construction company or somebody in the building industry to decide whether or not they want to do a project. Um, and then they'll often hire the architecture firm. Sometimes they're working with the architecture firm to figure out whether they want to do a project or not. Um, but there is often a lot of confusion initially about like, uh, do I want to, is design necessary? Is it, is it necessary for me to change my space to renovate or to grow or something like that? Or am I doing something because I want our, our company to come across in a different way culturally? Do I want it to be more like a Google? and come across like people want to work for us because of all the amenities that we provide. And the question there, I think is like, even if you do want that, and even if the architecture firm is allowed, is, is able to work with you to create a more, more open floor plan and more, you know, like jungle gym spaces or napping spaces or things like that, is that actually going to work for your culture in the end? And I think that's a question that sometimes is never answered and sometimes they create a new space and then realize, oh, this is, this space isn't work, work, going to work for us. So doing a lot of programming early on and programming is a really complicated term because programming is actually a term that both clients and architects use and they use it in very different ways. So when you use the same term and you try to come to a, if if a client for example thinks that they've already done programming and the architecture firm comes to them and says hey i want to do programming then often they'll say no i don't we don't need you to do that we already did that um, when in reality the programming that the client does might be quantitative where the programming that the architect does might be qualitative and you need both so i think programming is a really complicated term that makes it so that some of these questions of why why am I designing or uh, what are my needs really don't always get answered to the best extent in the beginning. Well, that seemed to answer both of the questions. How does an architecture firm deal when they don't know what the client's needs are? And also, how does the client approach that when they don't know what their needs are? Was there anything else you wanted to add to that? No, I don't think so. I think that my, uh, the thing that I would like to encourage people is like, instead of using this term programming and um, break it down and really say, Hey, have you, you know, have you interviewed all of your constituents? Have you, um, interviewed stakeholders? Have you interviewed, you know, your C-suite and, uh, really found, figured out what they want from this new space? If you've done the interviewing, have you come up with, uh, numbers of what this, what types of spaces you want? Or, or are you just coming to me with numbers and have having not done any of the interviewing or any of the observing of the spaces themselves? So breaking, breaking the term down and really saying what you would do in programming really helps to communicate better with the client around what that process really means. Darby, I know a lot of your work focused around how firms present themselves, how they interact with clients, and ultimately how they can get hired and further their own personal goals and the goals of their firm. Are there any other things that you haven't touched on in terms of that question? How does a firm further its own goals in this process of this dance that happens initially with a client? I think the other thing is that a lot of firms may think they know what the outcome is that they want. And so they, they, sometimes dismiss the outcome that actually happens. Um, so the best example that I can bring up of this is a lot of firms um, may either talk about or actually do a debriefing interview after the, after the interview, once they've um, lost the, the project. And uh, in that debriefing interview, the client may or may not, usually doesn't say why they lost that particular project. And so firms start to question, why am I doing this debriefing interview at all? If I'm not going to get the answer that I want, which is why I lost, then why should I do this in the first place? And uh, the answer to that is that the point of the debriefing interview 
should be and and often is helpful to be that what you're doing there is just connecting with the client one more time making one more engagement session with that client and that allows you to pursue a project in the future with that client even if you lost this this particular project and keeping on with the debriefing interview like not just doing it that one time right after the interview but maybe doing it uh you know a couple months down the road and connecting them with them again being like hey we we worked with you you know and pursued this one project and we just want to check in and see how things are going and if you're interested in um you know you don't even have to say if you're interested in doing something else but you can just connect with them again and that i think is really the point of a debriefing interview the other thing that i found on the, the opposite end um was uh that they uh every firm that i was with the the only um, sheet of paper that they had was this initial questionnaire form um, that uh, firms fill out to determine the go no go process. And uh, despite the fact that all three firms um, all had that sheet of paper when they may not have had other types of papers um, in in this uh, pursuit process, they either never didn't use the the go no go questionnaire or they uh, used it and kind of ignored the outcome or kind of skewed the outcome to be what they wanted it to be. And I found that really interesting because uh, oftentimes what the go, no go questionnaires were not including was that qualitative piece of, I want to work with this uh, project because it's going to be an amazing design and I really love designing. Well, that, uh, go no go questionnaire might not uh, include that piece in it and so uh, they might have to tweak the numbers in that questionnaire to make it a go um, because they want to do that amazing design even if um, they might not know that client at all and they might not get a lot of even uh, money for that project or something like that so yeah, that was another interesting thing that I saw on the architecture firm side. And I also saw it in the client, um, in the clients, because uh, in their RFPs and RFQs, um, they would often mention that they, uh, you know, were looking at the quantitative, like, cost of the project and might hire for the cost of the project when in reality what they would often what i would most often see them hiring for was that personal connection that they had with the architecture firm so there's a lot more qualitative reasons on both the architect and the client side to go after a project than what is often acknowledged and when you looked at firms, perhaps maybe that were more successful than others, was there, was there anything that stood out to you that one firm was doing that was particularly successful that other firms weren't doing? That's an interesting question. I think um, thinking about one of the firms, um, they uh, really did a lot to, to show their personality in the interview. So they, um, for, uh, one example that I uh, have is they went at, so all these firms were in the Michigan area. So there was a, a lot of auto related companies that they that these firms were pursuing. Um, and in one particular uh, interview, the um, architecture firm uh, bought a bunch of chocolate cars to bring to their client and um, really uh, give to the client at the end of the interview. The, this was just one example. They also had, you know, popcorn and mugs and all kinds of tchotchkes, quote unquote, to give to their clients. And it's interesting because one of the things that a lot of firms <laughs> didn't really want to hear, um, but is the truth, is after going through so many different and seeing so many architecture firms present, it's often these little things that the client will remember. So they might not remember, you know, what projects you presented or, you know, who was on the team even necessarily, um, but they might remember you as, oh, that was the popcorn uh, fir firm. I really liked, you know, the engagement that we had around popcorn. And it's, it's often those little things that really make the connection deeper and, and easier because you often start talking about things that are not work related. Um, when you bring in popcorn or when you bring in chocolate cars. Um, so 
that was one of the things that I presented to the firms that they were kind of surprised by and didn't necessarily want to hear because they spend so much time working on the, the presentation itself, but uh, that these little things really affect, you know, the outcome sometimes. Was there any other feedback that you gave them that you found they were reluctant to accept or to listen to? I wouldn't say reluctant. Um, I think that some of it was hard for them to hear. And I think the other thing too is trying to compare themselves to, you know, if, if I were to go into an architecture firm and tell them, hey, you guys need to have TV commercials. <laughs> And, you know, having TV commercials is going to allow you to um, sell yourselves better. Um, they would have a lot of problems with that. Number one, people watch TV commercials, not companies. So that, that was one of the responses that I uh, would hear if I, if I brought up that in any way, which is interesting because people make up companies. That's an interesting piece. And also selling yourself. Uh, a lot of firms don't like that term at all. You kind of have to talk around it and, and say, you know, talking about um, the, the things that, are, that make you different rather than selling. And uh, yeah, I think that if I try to talk about um, the ways that they are like different from Apple or different from any other company that is a is is a product company rather than a service company. Architects are often very strong to to point out that that company is a product company, despite the fact that um, in the marketing industry and in uh, and in the history of marketing as a as a thing by itself. The difference between marketing a product and a service was pointed out several decades ago, but now the difference between selling a product and a service and in the world of a business school is no different. They, they, the belief now is that the two should be sell, sold or marketed um, to the same. Those are some of the things that uh, architect, architects and architecture firms tend to believe that, that maybe others don't. So those are the things that tend to have a little bit more friction around. Sure, hard to hard to listen to as as you put it. Now, concerning television commercials, is this something that you feel tell us about that? Is this something you feel architecture firms should be involved in? I think that the my answer to that is whatever way the architecture firm can make themselves more known is what the architecture firms should be doing. So I don't think that you know, for some, for some firms that might be TV commercials, for some firms um, that might be going next door and um, posting, you know, a, a note on the, uh, on your neighbor's door or knocking on the door and introducing yourself. Whatever you can do to make yourselves more known is what you should be doing and whatever works for your industry. I don't think TV commercials is going to work for, you know, a very uh, rural place necessarily. Um, or, you know, it depends on, on the uh, client that you're trying to reach. So, no, I don't think there's one answer for, for that. I just think whatever works for you and for your clients to make yourself more known and make your name more uh, of a household name. Um, so that when, regardless of whether it's a business hiring you or an individual hiring you, when whoever goes to, to think about an architecture firm, they can say, hey, I know that firm. I can name a firm. And uh, why don't we reach out to them? So, yeah, I think that's what, what firms should be doing, not just TV commercials or something like that. Do any effective ways come to mind that, that you'd recommend that firms get involved with to get their visibility heightened, get their name out there in front of their prospective clients? Yeah, again, I think this is very cultural specific, but the, the more that you can do things outside of the building industry, so engaging with anthropologists, <laughs> um, engaging with, you know, your neighbors, um, going to town hall meetings, going to conferences, going to, you know, whatever you can that uh, is where your client pool tends to gather is, will be helpful for you. Um, so if they have a meetup group that they go to, or if they have whatever it may be, depending on the type of client, 
attending that and, and uh, making those people know your name, even if you're only one of the people at your firm. But I think also uh, the idea that like everybody at the firm should be marketing in some way. So, you know, everybody at the firm should be, uh, and when somebody asks you where you work, like saying the name of the firm and saying what you do and talking about that is really going to be helpful. As we finish up our time here together, Darby, what, what singular message would you have for my audience that includes designers, architects, and people in the building industry from around the world? So a lot of the things that I spoke about with the, the way the process works is, is specific to here in the States and often uh, was specific to the, the three firms that I uh, spent time with. I, I don't name those firms because I think that some of the findings that I found um, pertain to a lot of different firms. And I know that the way the pursuit process works is very different um, internationally than here in the States um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, so I think that uh, one of the things that I really want to say is um, embracing outsiders and really uh, having us come in and, and um, work alongside you. And I don't just mean others in the building industry. I mean, whoever uh, reaches out to you and, and wants to engage with you. Um, I think that is very helpful. I know um, some of the firms that I was with uh, worked with alongside, um, you know, they would go after a hospital project with a, a nurse on their team for interviewing or things like that. As many of the, the outsiders that we can embrace and the people that are different from us is that we can embrace in this pursuit process, um, the better. And, and again, as I said earlier, the, the more we can acknowledge that we are different and we might not know everything about who they are or what they're doing, that is also extremely helpful. And I think some of these things go beyond just architecture to, you know, how we uh, engage in life as well. Darby, how can people find out more about the findings that you found in your dissertation? Yes, um, this is a good question. People would be, I would be happy to engage with anybody over email. Um, my email is darbyji at gmail.com. And I would be happy to, to send anybody my uh, dissertation findings. I believe it should be online as well. Um, my first name actually is Jennifer. So if you uh, search Jennifer Morris uh, dissertation at the University of Michigan. Um, you'll find some information there as well. And I'm also on LinkedIn. So yeah, feel free to connect with me in any way you want to. And I'd be happy to um, speak with you more. Fantastic. So we'll make sure that those resources are added to the show notes on businessofarchitecture.com. So our listeners can find easy links to those there. And Darby Morris, thank you for joining us today on the Business of Architecture podcast of bringing an anthropologist perspective to the practice and business of architecture. Thank you very much. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelming fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.